All right. So um, this workshop today, Advanced Reading Strategies, is part of the Maximizing Productivity in Graduate School workshop series. Um, and so we'll have a few more of these sessions. You are, of course, welcome to attend any of our um, academic success workshops, but we do have this series which is specifically geared towards graduate students. Um, if you registered to, before today, I sent you earlier um, some handouts. We are going to use a couple of these readings during the session um, as a workshop. Um, I like to, to do things that are really hands-on and give you an opportunity to practice. If this is your first time using Blackboard Collaborate, let me give you a quick orientation to the screen. In the upper left-hand corner, we have the hamburger menu. If you're finding that you're having any trouble with the audio, you can use your phone for audio and it will give you the phone number that you can utilize. Along the bottom, there's a little circle with, your, with the outline of a person. That's your status and you can check on your status. Um, next to that is a microphone. I want to invite you if you want to contribute and you want to turn on your microphone, you are welcome to do that. Um, and you need to authorize your browser to allow you to talk. Next to that is a video camera. If you want to be seen, you can turn on your video camera. And then the fourth icon is an outline of a person with their hand raised. If you want to get my attention while I'm speaking, you can raise your hand um, and then I can call uh, so that you can either turn on your microphone or you can, you can share um, in, in the chat at any time. So the other piece is down in the bottom right corner, there's a little pink tab with some arrows. And if you click on that, the Collaborate panel will open. And the very first area is a, a little talk bubble, and that is chat. So you can send a chat message um, to everybody. Um, and because this is a workshop, I do want to encourage everybody to participate. And you can participate by posting in the chat. You can um, chat with each other. Um, just be aware that I can see the chat. Um, you can ask me a question in the chat, or you can, like I said, turn on your microphone because um, we want to try and get folks involved with the session today. Excellent. So here we go. So we're going to start this session with a brain teaser. This is one of the readings I sent out. It was a, a sheet that should have three readings on it, but you can certainly look at it here on the screen. The other piece I forgot to share, um, there is a, like a rectangle with some lines and a magnifying glass. If I'm showing something on the screen that's just a little too small for you, you can open these view controls. And that will allow you to make uh, an image larger or smaller for yourself. So that it's easier to view. All right, so for this first activity, for this brain teaser, I've got a reading listed here. And I want you to read it, but you're going to need to do something differently in order to understand it. So challenge yourself to read it a little bit differently, but see if you can figure out um, one, what's the main idea of the paragraph? And two, how do you read it? Like, what's the technique that you can use to read it? So I'm going to be quiet and give you guys um, a couple of minutes to take a look at it. When you've finished, um, click the little hand raise icon so that I know you're done. If you just joined us, I asked folks to read the paragraph on the screen.
see if they can figure out the main idea and the strategy for actually reading this paragraph. All right, would anybody like to share what the main idea of the paragraph is? You can either do that in the chat or turn on your microphone. You're reading it from <clears throat> left to right for the first line and then looping around from right to left to the next line. So it's almost like a like a switchback kind of reading procedure. Excellent. And then we've got some folks post in the chat. Um, there's always another way to do something and doing something again will make it easier. Okay, great. So yes, we're gonna go left to right, right to left, left to right, right to left. Now, why would I start you guys off with a brain teaser? And this brain teaser in particular, Yes, Marta, I want folks to think about reading a little bit differently. We all have habits of the way that we like to do our reading. And I want to introduce, I'm going to introduce some stuff that you might be like, yeah, that's weird. Try to keep an open mind with it. Yasmin, Yasmin says there are different ways of doing things. Yeah, so please try to keep an open mind and be willing to share some of the strategies that you guys are using. All right, so we're going to talk about some of the challenges of reading in graduate school. Um, I will give you some strategies for reading a little bit faster. And then I want to talk how to do skimming. We tell people to skim all the time, but we never explain how to do it. And then we'll get into some strategies like recitation. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, highlighting and annotating. And then we'll do a more advanced strategy called SQ4R, um, a strategy to use when you don't have headings called chunking. And then we'll wrap it up with um, talking about research articles. So what are the challenges that you are facing with reading in graduate school? Go ahead, Trevor. So I think with undergrad, I learned how to read. And you know, you read the summary at the beginning and the conclusion at the end, notice which are the high points, and then go back and skim those. With graduate school reading, for me, it's a lot more case study, which doesn't, it's not constructed the same way. And the writing is different, so the reading has to change with it. Yeah, yeah. So that you've got different kind of reading. Excellent. Um, let's see what folks are putting in the chat. A lot of reading, so much to read. Okay, so much to read. There's a lot of reading and not a lot of time to do it. Too many articles to read. The quantity, the amount, there's a lot of reading. Volume, volume, and more volume, Matthew says. Marta says, too much. Amount of reading and certain readings are very dense and difficult to understand. That is a good point, Allie. Um, Asia says, attention, competing life commitments that require time. Yeah, life doesn't stop because of grad school. Uh, we forget what we read. 
Yasmin says new language. Oh yes, huge challenge to be studying in um, another language than our native language. Absolutely, fantastic. So the volume is the first thing that everybody says. It's so much more reading than you're probably used to. And the other thing is you kind of actually have to do it. Um, there were definitely some classes in undergrad that I didn't ever have to crack open a book. Um, but in graduate school, I, I absolutely had to do my reading. And even in a new language in English, depending on your field, yeah, so that's gonna, I'm gonna get to that in a second. We're also tending to be reading more primary sources. And as you had mentioned, you, you're reading more case studies now, and that's a different kind of reading than um, reading a textbook um, or even an essay. It it's requires different strategies, and your purpose is a little bit different. Primary sources are, you know, uh, original research that have, has been done. They are written with other experts in mind. Well, you guys, as graduate students, you're actually novices. You're not experts yet. You're working towards becoming an expert in your particular field. And you have to remember, the primary sources are not written with you in mind. They are written with other experts in mind. Um, so in undergrad, we read a lot of um, secondary or tertiary sources, like, like a textbook or an article summarizing the information. It's a lot more complex. It's a lot more dense than we're used to, and it tends to have a lot of jargon. So jargon is specialized language that is specific to that discipline or field. So that really, you know, yes, I mean, when you're talking about even in English, all of a sudden, if you're thrown into this and you're not familiar with a lot of the lingo, um, a lot of the, the terminology, a lot of the new words that are used, it makes it really challenging to do this kind of reading. So what are some strategies that you guys have started to use or have been using to deal with this huge volume of reading that you've got to get done? Okay, so controlling your distractions, like turning off your email and your phone. Teresa is scheduling some time to do it. Same with Olivia, making a schedule for reading and sticking to it. Jen's breaking it up instead of doing it all at once. <laughs> Matthew says caffeine. Um, having your kids help hold you accountable. That's a good strategy. Ishwarya is taking notes. Bill is trying to read earlier in the day. That's a great strategy because if it takes an hour to do a task in the daytime, it takes an hour and a half at night. So doing most of your cognitive work in the daylight hours is going to be great. Um, Naomi uses writing a summary of the main idea in your own words. That's great because it's a lot easier to remember your own words and it, you show that you actually understood it if you cannot. Writing some notes in the margin. Turning key points into your own words. Phil says sleep. So getting adequate sleep or are you sleeping instead of reading? Definitely want to get adequate sleep. Setting timers. Shauna says setting timers. Um, are, Shauna, are you using uh, like a specific time period to stay focused? Like how long do you set your timer for? Okay, so Shauna, is 30 minutes. Do you take a break then afterwards? And a six minute break. So 30 minutes with a six minute break. Having that timer, it gives you like a little kick of adrenaline because you're racing that timer. And it also means if you lose focus, you've only lost 30 minutes. You didn't lose like hours. Let's see, Kratz says noise canceling headphones, marking important points with sticky note flags and going back and writing notes after reading. I'm a big fan of flags. I have my flags sitting right next to me. I use them all the time. Now, highlighting the important, the important key terms. Okay, fantastic. You guys have great, great strategies. So the big secret I'll share with you guys is do not, you do not need to read every word on every page. So even though there, there's a lot more reading and it's a lot more complex, 
um, and there's a lot more to learn, you really just don't have time to read every word on every page, and that's not exactly your purpose. You know, we're not trying to just memorize this information. We're trying to figure out what are the main points, what are the main takeaways from it, and I don't have to necessarily read every word on every page. Now, there are going to be times when you do need to do a deep dive for reading, but not most of the reading you're doing. Kind of, especially for these, uh, if you're early in your grad program, the first few classes are kind of like survey classes where they introduce you to a whole bunch of the, the, the theories and information and maybe the history. And so you just want to get the, um, the main ideas from that without doing a deep dive right now. You would do a deep dive later on. I found study groups in grad school to be incredibly helpful. And what we did was to break up our readings and each person in the study group was responsible for doing a summary of the main points. And we would meet and each person would kind of summarize their, their reading. So we didn't actually read everything. We broke it down and each person had some responsibility. And then you kind of were the expert on the one that you did the reading on and that you took the notes on. So that was incredibly helpful for me in graduate school. There's also a strategy if if you're um, if the reading you're doing is a PDF document, you can actually convert that to an audio file. Um, and I have a lot of um, friends who did this, and they would, um, especially when they were commuting. Now a lot of people are working from home, which is great. But if they had a long commute in the car, they would um, convert like research articles or chapter chapters that professors wanted us to read into an audio file and then listen to it in the car as they were commuting to and from school or to and from their jobs. There is a program called Read and Write Gold that you have access to for free from George Mason University. I'm going to show you a screenshot in just a second uh, and explain how to download that and actually has some other um, features to it as well, which are really helpful. And then, of course, there's this whole strategy of, like, you need to read faster. All right, so let me show you. Um, in Blackboard, on the main page, there's, like, your home page when you very first log in. You can actually add different modules to your main page. So you might put, like, you know, events that are happening. But one of the modules that's available is called accessibility. This is provided by the... Um, um, Assistive Technology Initiative Office, which is located in Aquia. And so they help students get access to materials if they have disabilities. But the nice thing is they are trying to serve all Mason students. So that's why they've made this available to everybody at the university. So the first um, software download is this Read and Write. And it has, it will, it will read a web page to you. It will convert this. It's got some features to help you with writing as well. Download Natural Reader. Um, it's the same thing. It'll it'll read documents to you. And Sonus and Audio Note Taker is for taking notes during class. Oh, Phil says you can also send PDF files to your Kindle via your email address, your Kindle email, which may make e reading easier and more flexible. <gasps> That's great. I didn't know you could do that. I'm going to have to try that because I have a lot of um, documents that I read in, and it is kind of hard. To, it is a little bit easier to read it on a Kindle. So you can download this. Um, if you're going to use the Sonison Audio Note Taker, what that does is it records the session, like the audio, and you can upload the PowerPoint and then type in your notes next to it. Make sure you get permission before you record a class. Um, unless you have that as an accommodation, because some classes, it's not um, conducive. Like if you're taking a counseling class and people are practicing counseling techniques, people wouldn't want that recorded. So, and it's also copyrighted information. So make sure you check with your instructor or your professor before you just start audio recording a class. All right, so some strategies that you could use to read faster. And a few of you have mentioned this. Reduce your distractions. Um, with our memory, we're constantly being inundated by stimuli in our environment. And with your sensory memory, that's the first like gatekeeper that information has to get through in order to start getting your working memory and then your long-term memory. Um, so if you've got all the stimuli, sound, sight, you know, 
um, smells, everything like inundating you at once, it's hard to concentrate on the reading. So, um, you know, having good lighting, um, putting your, uh, your electronic devices in airplane mode, um, turning off uh, alerts, or even putting your phone someplace else, not having the TV on in the background is a big one. Even if you have the volume low, it still kind of pulls your attention. And um, when they've done research studies on this, people who uh, read even when the volume was low reported that their reading was more boring than people who did not have the television on at all. So just get rid of that temptation entirely. Um, you can read faster by skimming or scanning. Skimming is when you're wanting to get a quick overview of the main ideas of a piece of reading. Scanning is when you're looking for a specific piece of information. So for example, if I'm looking for a date, I'm going to scan really quickly until I find that date in that reading. Or I'm looking for a particular theory or author, or sometimes I'll scan just for something that's new because I'm familiar with a topic. Um, so we'll, people just usually say skimming, and they actually mean that they're scanning. So like I said, I'm going to talk more about skimming in a second. Another thing that can happen when you're reading is, have you ever read a paragraph and then you understood it, but you don't trust yourself, so you read it again? This is a bad habit. It's called a regression. So it's when you read and then you read it again. This will double how much time it takes you, at least if you're reading it twice, could triple the amount of time it takes. So a strategy I use a lot with people in person is um, if it's printed document, we'll get an index card. And I'm like, I'm not in my office. I'm working from home, so I don't have any index cards. But we'll take the reading, and we'll put the index card at the top of the page. And as the student reads, we push the card down to cover up what's already been read. This takes practice um, because it can, it can feel frustrating, like, oh my god, I didn't remember every single thing. And you have to remind yourself, I'm not trying to memorize every word. I'm just trying to get the gist of this. I'm just trying to get the main information, the main points. I don't have to remember all of it. And so the more you do it, the better you get at it. It also is helpful if you get distracted and you have a hard time like following a line of text to be able to cover that up. So I've primarily used it with prints. There's actually reading guides that you can get. Acronyms do that to me. When I cannot remember what they stand for, I have to go back to the first page and find it all spelled out. Yeah, because it's like, oh, what does this mean? The more you do the reading, the more familiar you get with the link, Julio, the less you have to do that. But I, I have to do that a lot of times because we have so many acronyms in university life. I'm like, what, what are they talking about? The TFF, what's that? I have no idea. So try to get out of that habit that um, of rereading and when it's not necessarily important to what you're trying to understand in that exact moment. And you can like cut out a little line in an index card and use that so you can only see one or two lines at a time. How does that note card reading work with flags and highlighting? So the thing with when you're doing flagging and highlighting, you want to read and then flag or highlight. So in that case, you might need to move that note card out of the way so you can highlight the proper part. So that's OK. That's a little different than actually going back and rereading a whole thing. So you might read a passage and then decide which parts you're going to annotate or underline or highlight or flag. Um, so that's OK as long as you're not rereading the whole entire thing. Um, using a pointer. Um, I do this a lot too. I'll use my finger to keep track of the line that I'm on or I will, I'm sorry, I don't want to be, I'll use the eraser side. Usually I use the tip of my pencil, but that's a little rude. Um, <laughs> I'll use the tip of my pencil to follow the line and I'll, I'll do it on the screen too um, in, in addition to doing it on pencil and paper. Now if you use something like read and write where it's reading it out loud to you, it will highlight the text as it goes. So that's really nice. It helps you stay on track with which line that you're looking at. And as was alluded to earlier, read in short bursts, followed by a, a short five-minute break, recharge your batteries, and refocus. 
Um, but having working, you'd be really surprised how much you can actually get done in those really short, intense bursts where you're fully focused. Now, if you find when you're reading that you're often getting distracted, not necessarily by environmental cues, but more internal, um, one strategy you can do is to keep a, a concentration score sheet and say, okay, for 25 minutes, I'm going to read. And every time I get distracted, I'm going to take the scrap paper. I'm going to make a little tick mark. I'm going to keep track how many times they get distracted. Okay. When everybody gets distracted, it's about catching yourself and pulling yourself back and paying attention. So that's one strategy. The second strategy you could do, if you find you're getting distracted by worrying thoughts, instead keep a worry pad. So again, just having a little notebook next to you. I always have a notepad nearby. And you can write down on the notepad anything that's, that's pulling your attention, like, don't forget to pay the rent. Um, I had to get groceries. I really need to talk to my sister about that fight that we had the other day. When we're worried about things, we ruminate on them. We think about them over and over again because we're afraid we're going to forget about them. It's eating up your whole working memory, and you don't have any room to actually pay attention to the reading and to try to understand it. So write those things down and then set a specific time later in the day to actually address those issues. Like, okay, at 3 o'clock, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to write the right rent check. I'm going to take care of this other thing, and um, I'm going to see about finding a time to talk with my sister. Um, so you can actually schedule some worry time, and that helps get that out of your head. The more you can read in the daytime, the better off you'll be, the more attention and focus you can give to it. All right, and if you have questions as I go, just drop those questions in or turn on your microphone. So let's talk about how you can skim and how you can skim effectively. So the strategy is that you should read the title and first think about what do I already know about this topic? Chances are you know something. And this is really good because it helps you um, do what's called activation of your prior knowledge. It's a lot easier to connect new information with what you already know, even if it seems unrelated. Um, so I'll, I'll relate things that I'm learning you know, if we're, if we're talking about, actually, I use my hands for neurons all the time. My hands are not neurons, but, you know, I can use these shapes to help remind me of different things, like, oh, these are axons and these are synapses. And so I relate that visual of my hands. It helps me remember information about neurons in the brain. So it might seem like it's unrelated, but I'm like, oh, yeah, my hand kind of looks like a neuron. So read the title, think about what do I already know about this topic. Don't spend a lot of time. It's like 30 seconds to one minute. You're also saying, brain, pay attention, we're getting ready. And then whatever the piece is, like you're going to read, if it's a chapter or an article, you read the first and last, well, I'll talk about articles, that's a little different. The first paragraph and the last paragraph. Then you're going to go through back at the beginning and read the first and last sentence of each paragraph. And you're just trying to get the gist of it. What are the main points? When I'm reading, I'm looking for what are called signposts. If it says um, the three most important factors to consider, okay, three, there's going to be a list someplace. Or a word like the most significant or the definition. These are signposts, and it's telling me, hey, this information is important. You probably want to pay attention to this. Now, the foundation of all the reading strategies we're going to talk about is a, a strategy called recitation. Um, and it seems really basic, but I think it's important for us to, to do. And that is for you to practice reading. And you, when you read, you want to identify the topic. And then what's the so what? Like, what's the point? You can always ask, you can do a read, you can read something and then say, so what, or what's the author's assertion in this passage? So here I've got a paragraph, and I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to read it. And when you think you know what, you know, so you're going to take a look at it, read it. And traditionally, the way that we recite, you can't see the screen. Okay. Oh, hang on, let me try. Sharing. I'll try and share again.
Are you able to see the PowerPoint now? Oh, that was weird. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Thank you for letting me know. All right, so what we're going to do, the way you traditionally recite is you read a passage and then you look away from it and you say out loud what the passage is about very, very briefly. Um, a lot of people feel uncomfortable reciting out loud, but you have to think about in terms of your neurons, uh, if you read it and then you say it out loud, we're using different neural pathways to get at that information. But you can also recite by writing, and usually it's just writing a sentence. So I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to read through this passage and then practice reciting. If you don't know what the, what the main idea is or the takeaway is, you know, read through it again. And when you're ready, we'll have somebody go ahead and type in the chat, a couple people, what you think the takeaway, what's the so what of this paragraph. Okay, so I'll be quiet. All right, so when you've got the so what, feel free to go ahead and type that in the chat. One sentence, what's this paragraph about? Speed reading is a waste of time and doesn't work. Speed reading is overrated when it comes to learning a text. Speed reading will not help you learn faster or better. Speed reading isn't going to help you understand what you read or what you read. Speed reading works on digital devices. Not sure as I speed read it. <laughs> speed reading itself isn't as helpful as it seems. Excellent, you guys did great. So everybody kind of had a slightly different sentence, but you got the gist of it. That's all we want is that quick takeaway. Doing reciting as you go, as you're reading, helps keep you honest with yourself, right? So if you can say what it was about, then you know that you were paying attention. Um, I, there's nothing worse than like you sat down and you read something for 45 minutes and you get to the end and you're like, I have no idea what I just read. So you can recite a paragraph at a time, a section at a time, um, a page at a time. There's, there's different ways to kind of chunk it, um, but check in, um, check in with yourself and, and you can recite out loud. You can recite with the note, or you can recite um, with the inclusion of like highlighting or underlining. Um, but check in and see, did I understand what I just read? Maybe I don't understand everything, and that's good, too, because then you can write down questions to ask your classmates or ask the professor. But use this as the foundation for any other reading strategy that, that you try. All right, so we're going to build on top of that. Now, it says, why should you mark your textbook? It probably should be more like, why should you take notes? And marking your textbook is one way of, of note-taking. I know everything is digital nowadays, um, but I do really like interacting with my reading. Um, 
one way to interact with your reading is by using highlighting or underlining. If you're using a physical book, like I have a book right here, if you're using a physical book and it's your book, oh, you still didn't understand what the paragraph meant? So the topic of the paragraph was speed reading, and the author's assertion is that you can read faster, but you cannot learn from speed reading. Speed reading is moving your eyes very quickly over a passage. And there are like workshops and programs you can purchase and all this. And they're like, you can read thousands of words a minute. And the reality is that you can maybe look at lots of words, but you're not going to be able to actually remember and learn the information. Yeah, you make the best of both worlds. Yeah. So we need to probably not read as quickly. We're just not going to read every word. That's the way we're going to read faster. Instead of moving our eyes really fast over the page, we're just going to be very selective in what we're actually looking at. So underlining or highlighting. All right. So I've got my book that I bought at the bookstore, and you know, undergrad, I'd sell them back. And there's always that myth, if you write in your book, you're not going to be able to sell it back or it's going to make it lower. Yeah, it, it, even if I spent $200 on this book, there's still going to be $5 at the bookstore. Now, if you sell it online, it does affect the buyback price of the book if you, if you like to sell your books online. And if it's a rental, some are okay with you marketing in them, some are not. Um, but in grad school, a lot of times they say, get your book and you buy it and you keep it because you're meant to be built, building up your library um, that you're going to use at when you're as a professional in your career. Most people mark way too much. They mark way too much. So the trick is that you read first, you're going to recite in your mind what you think the takeaways are, then you're going to mark. All right. So don't mark as you go. You'll end up marking everything because everything at the time will seem important. What we're shooting for is to have less than 20% of the passage marked. Now, it seems like I'm talking about, I, I'm, I'm old and analog, right? I, I like the whole haptic sense of touching some, some right reading, but I do actually do a lot of reading that's digital. You can still highlight and mark in a digital format. Annotation, fancy word for saying write notes in the margin. And, um, you can annotate by paragraph or by section. Um, it just some, just something to help remind you of the main idea. So let's just have, I'm going to read this passage out loud, and I'm going to, I'm not sure if it'll let me, let's see, actually highlight. No, it's not going to let me highlight. But I can explain what I would highlight on this. I'm just going to do that. So you've got this reading for yourself as well. But I'm going to read it out loud, and then I'll explain what I would highlight. So think to yourself the same thing. What's the topic? What's the takeaway? Like, what's the so what? What words and phrases could I mark in to remind me of the main idea? Americans exchange around 1 billion colds a year, an average of two or three for every adult. Infection, infectious cold germs can live for hours in the environment, so take precautions. To avoid contamination, wash your hands frequently to keep from transferring germs to your eyes, mouth, and nose. Drink more water. The winter air dries your nose and throat and allows viruses to attach. Relax and network with friends because a healthy mind strengthens the immune system. So first thing I'm, I'm noting is that the topic of the passage is the colds. So that would actually be the first thing that I would underline or highlight. And then I would say, I would just actually highlight, wash your hands, oops, drink more water, go back, drink more water, and relax and work with friends. Because the whole, the, the so what of this is how you can avoid getting a cold. Um, and they gave us three tips. So that's what I would highlight. Other people are going to highlight different things. But I always like to do a, a think out loud of how I process this so that you know how you might be able to do it. Like having a strategy, like what are you going to highlight? 
But again, read it first, then go back. And you don't even have to mark entire sentences. You can just do um, keywords. Like, think of it like a text message to yourself instead of marking every single thing. Now, I have a passage of, a, of this book, actually, to show how I have marked. And I use underlining and circles. And then, in addition to underlining in the passage, I also annotated in the margin. And this just made it easier so I could see, like, a little list of, of the information. And I didn't have to scan through the whole writing, the whole reading passage to find the main points. And so this passage was talking about how we process information. And it involves um, encoding, storage, and then retrieval. And there's two different ways you can do retrieval. Retrieval through recall, where you just remember it, or retrieval through recognition, where you recognize something. So this little passage on the side actually is was really, really helpful. Now, I really encourage you to do marking because this may come back later. Um, I had to do a qualifying exam, and the qualifying exam was writing three 20-page papers in two weeks, and I was so grateful that I had annotated most of my readings because it made it a lot easier to go back and find the citations and find the information as opposed to having a plain book. Now, I didn't mention you can totally do separate notes. You can keep your notes in EndNote or another format, um, but have some kind of a strategy for taking notes, whether that's within the textbook itself or the reading itself or having it in a separate notes, just make sure you know where those notes are kept. Um, and then here's uh, an example of some marking that I have done based on my Kindle. And the Kindle has, when you do it on the computer, has this nice little feature where it'll, it'll pull up your notes and highlights. I actually didn't take any notes here. Um, but you can see I've highlighted in pink in one thing and then yellow in the other. But I could quickly scan my highlights if I didn't want to go through the whole entire passage, the whole chapter again, to find something in particular. A lot of the electronic chapters and options do give you an option to annotate uh, digitally. All right. So uh, let's, let's slide into our next strategy. And the first thing I'm going to ask you is there's a picture, hopefully, that you can see on your screen. Use the chat to tell me what you already know about this particular object. Candy. Okay, what else do you guys know? It's chocolate candy. It's sweet. It's colorful. They're plain M&Ms. They're multicolored. This bag is empty, sad face. I prefer peanut M&Ms over plain, so tapping into that prior knowledge. It's true to the size on the screen. This is a candy wrapper. It's smaller than the regular size. It's mini. It's fun size. Good. What can you tell by looking at the printing on the package? Some of it we can tell that it's milk chocolate, right, that it's not peanut or um, another kind. But what else can you tell by looking at the package? And that it's fun size. It has multicolored chocolates. What else? Go ahead and use that zoom in feature if you need it. The name of the product, good. That it's not for individual sale. Ooh, it contains milk and soy. The chocolates are spheres. The phone number, if we have questions, good. The website, mms.com. And you can find out what's inside the package. What do you think we would learn if we were, if it was actually full and we were in person and I actually handed each of you a little packet of this? It says it may contain peanuts, even though it says milk chocolate. Solid, okay. What can we tell if we were, if I actually handed these little packets to you in person and you opened it? What would you learn? <laughs> Generous. <laughs> Is that there's more than one who likes plain M and M's? Okay, what else? What how it smells? Might get distracted. How many are in the package? How they taste? How big they are? Excellent, fantastic. How they feel? 
We can see what colors are in there. Ooh, what emotions they elicit. Good. So this um, <laughs> it makes me happy. I wish we were in we were in person because we actually this is an exercise that I do in person and we actually go through and do this. Um, but the whole point of this is by looking at the package and thinking what you already know that was activating your prior knowledge and looking at the writing on the package it's similar to looking at the headings in a reading it's giving us a um, advanced organizer of what's going to come and then we can come up with some questions and when we actually start reading the passage or opening the package we can actually learn learn the answers hopefully to some of our questions so this all leads to this um, a little bit more advanced strategy, which the name of it is SQ4R. But let me explain how to do it. Let me summarize how to do it, because it's, sometimes the acronym throws people off. So what you do is when you have a reading, the first thing you do is to survey it. And I will look at the chapter title, and I'll see you try to find a chat. I should have. Flagged a page. Oh, okay. So I've got probably that one. intelligence and aging. All right, what do I already know about this? And then I'll flip through the pages really quickly, like literally as fast as I'm flipping through them now. And I'll see, like, look at the headings. I'll see if there's any pictures, see if there's any graphics. And then I like to see how many pages it is 191 page. Okay, it starts on one. So it's just, uh, it's like 25 pages long. I'll decide if I'm going to read it all at once or I'm going to break it up, okay? So that survey, it just takes like a minute, minute or two to do that where we get this first preview. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to find all these headings. I'm going to turn them into questions. Keep it simple. It's, people make really complex questions. It's almost always what. Um, or you can, so it's like who, what, when, why, or how are the questions that I would just add. So for the first heading I've got on here, concept of intelligence and its measurement. So I would make this question, um, what is intelligence and how is it measured? Actually, it would be this would be a more advanced kind of a question. I've got another a subheading here, intelligence testing with adults. How do you do intelligence testing with adults? Okay, very simple. It's almost always what, but you can use a how question. When I read this passage, I'm going to read the question I made. How do I do intelligence testing with adults? I'm going to read from this heading to the next one with the intention of answering that question. I'm going to write the answer to that question. So that's what I'm going to recite, right? So I've got my question. I'm reading with a purpose. What is the answer to this question? And I'm going to recite the answer in my own words and write a, write a note somehow, either by marking the book, or keeping separate notes or doing something. That's some other way of doing that, okay? So each heading I come to, I'm gonna do the same thing. Make the heading into a question, read the passage, recite the answer to the question, make a note. I'm just gonna do that over and over and over and over again for this whole passage. All right, so SQ4R is an acronym, and we like acronyms in learning assistance because it reminds us of the steps in the process, but it can seem a little overwhelming. So the first part was that survey where I just kind of flipped through the pages. I thought about what I already know, which was what we did with the M&Ms, right? We did something very similar. Um, and it took us longer probably to do the M&Ms exercise actually than, than for that minute that it took me to flip through the pages. And then the Q stands for question. That's where we're turning the headings into questions. And then we're going to read, recite, record a note. These things happen at the same time. And then the last R is, of course, review. We're, we're big fans of review. All right, I don't want to go through all these. Now, sometimes students misunderstand this, and they're like, I have to read this three times. No, you're not reading it three times. You're literally, yeah, you could review at the end, like look at your questions and your answers, or before you're using it for a paper, or before you're using it for something else. Um, you can use it for review before a test. But you're surveying like literally a minute. And then the bulk of it is using that heading, reading the heading, reading the question, moving on to the next. Reading the heading, reading the section, writing a note, moving on to the next. 
So you're really actually reading, reading it one time through. Um, and this is only good for textbooks, traditional textbooks. You can use it with some articles that have headings as well. Um, but this is really meant more for a traditional textbook. Okay. So I've got a whole bunch of slides on this. Don't worry about all this because I tend to make more slides than I need. All right. So I sent you guys a chapter from a textbook called, um, it's about friends. So I want you to take a couple of minutes to look at that friends chapter and identify the headings and turn them into questions. And again, don't overcomplicate it. I think the first heading is friends. So our question is going to be, what are friends? So I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to take. We're not reading yet. We're just taking those headings and turning them into questions. Okay, so you should have come up with five or six headings. There's a subheading that's a little bit hard to see. Okay, there's a subheading that's a little bit hard to see. Talk about that in a second. Okay, so our first heading is the big heading, and hopefully that's probably um, like, what are friends? Then our next heading is the nature of friendship. So we can say, what is the nature of friendship? Okay, great question, Jen. When I survey, I tend to get distracted by the extras. When is the best time to address the sidebars and graphics? I tend to read the passage first. And if it, um, if it refer, re references a figure in the passage, I will pause and look at the figure or the graphic at that time because they're explaining it. They're explaining what that graphic is at, in that moment, and then I'll look at it. Sometimes, it, but you, and usually, like even if it's a picture, they'll say as noted in picture, you know, whatever. Um, and I'll read the caption at that time. Um, but you might decide that you're going to look at that first and then read the passage. Um, but you definitely want to take a look at it. Just have a strategy, either that you're going to read the passage and then look at the graphics, or look at the graphics and then look at the passage. You are welcome. So our next heading is a sub-subheading. It's three types of friendships. Then we've got the needs of friendship. So what are the needs of friendship? And then I think we've got one more heading. Stages in communication and friendship development. So again, I can just put the word what. What are the stages in communication and friendship development? All right. So let's look at the bottom of the page that's marked 181. So it's the page at the top. It says the nature of friendship. And towards the bottom, there's a little gap, and it says three types of friendships. If we make that into a question, what are the three types of friendships? 
You're welcome, Shauna. Thanks for coming. Please read this paragraph with the intention of answering the three types of friendships. When you've got the three types of friendships, type them into the chat box for me. Excellent. The three types of friendships are reciprocity, receptivity, and association. You didn't have to read very far to actually find that answer. Now, if you don't know what reciprocity, receptivity, and association mean, you probably need to read a little bit more. Um, but just realize that like each section is going to have a main idea, and then it will have supporting points to it. That's why we don't always have to read every single word. Um, especially if you're really familiar with it. So, you you know, I would need to read a little further because I don't know what reciprocity means. But the answer to the question was in, let's see, one, two, the, th the third sentence down after that heading. So the headings are your best friend. You're welcome. Take care. Um, your headings are your best friend because that tells you what the main points are. All right, so please utilize that. I used to always skip over the headings. I used to think they were irrelevant, but that's actually one of the most important things. Now, if you don't have headings, a strategy you can use is um, called chunking. And I don't know that we'll have time to do the, the chunking practice, but what you do for this is that you read, and as you read, make a like mark in the margin each time the author changes topics. And then what I do is go back and I kind of make my own headings. Honestly, I put a word or a phrase in the margin next to that section to demonstrate in my mind what that section is about. Okay, so I sent you the very pricey pineapple reading. You, you don't need to do it um, right now because I want to make sure I talk about how to read research articles. But this is a really great strategy. And the reason is your brain likes information to be organized. Your brain likes little chunks of information. One of the reasons it's so hard to read on um, on the web, on the internet, because like if, a, if something is really long and there's no break, no natural break to it, it just keeps going. Your brain doesn't know how to like say, oh, this is one piece, this is one piece, this is one piece. That's why we like pages. Or reading on a Kindle can be easier because it really uses a page as a chunk, makes it a little bit easier to read and understand than just reading on um, a computer where it just seems like it never ends. So by adding these like headings in between, it makes the chunks a little bit more manageable for you as an individual. All right, let's talk about it. Let's get down to it. How do I read research articles? Now, this is one of the harder things because again, like I said, they are not written for you. They are written for other experts in the field, even sub experts, like people who have really specialized information. And they're organized in a very different way. So they've got different sections, and the first is called the abstract. The abstract is a little summary of what the research article was about. Then we've got the introduction, you are welcome, um, which has, like, it'll say, here's the context around this particular issue, and here's the gap in the knowledge and why I did this particular study. Then there's the next section, um, and it has different titles depending on what field you're in. It might be called methods, observations, or procedure. This is how the study was done. And then we've got a section for the results. You're welcome. And then finally, the conclusions and discussion, and of course the references at the very end. Now, in a chapter, in a book, you're going to read it beginning to end. You'll read it in order, even if you're not reading every word. Like, if we're just skimming it, we're still going to do it in order. We don't read research articles in order. And honestly, sometimes all you need to read is the abstract, okay? Your abstract is going to be that summary that says, here's what the study was about and here's what we learned. That might be all that you need. 
Now, if you're taking a um, more advanced research methods class, you might need to get in there and like analyze the methodology or taking statistics. I know when I took statistics, we like had to go in and look and see what did they use appropriate statistics? Did they come to the right conclusions? But if I'm going to read the whole article, I'm not going to read it beginning to end. I'm going to read the abstract carefully. I'm going to read through the introduction and then I'm going to skip the guts and skim the end. How did the study turn out? Sometimes that's all I need to read, and that's it. I'm going to move on. But if I need to read more, I'm going to go to the methods section, and I'm going to critique it and read the results but not get bogged down in the details, right? So sometimes I read about neuroscience stuff, and I don't know anything about fMRI machines and things like that, and I try not to get that to distract me um, too much. Yeah, sometimes the conclusion is too short, depending on the field you're in. So you might need to go ahead and look at those methods and results, but you're going to read your conclusion first. So abstract intro, jump to the end, read the conclusion, then go back to the methods and then read the results. And then the proper way to do it is that you're supposed to read the conclusion again. Um, that's up to you. I'm not going to come check on you <laughs> if you're reading it multiple times. But really think about why am I reading this? Am I just trying to find something I can cite? So yeah, getting into lit review, that's a whole other thing. Even for a lit review though, um, often you're reading 20, 30, 40 um, sources, and I'll find like, I only referenced one little tiny bit of this article that I looked at. Um, so I didn't necessarily need to do a deep dive unless I'm going in and critiquing and saying, okay, this methodology, I can do a better methodology for my own stuff. And so I'm gonna do a lit review of talking about methodology. Um, in, in more detail, but for the most part, you don't need to go into all the tiny details. It helps to know where the article is reading is heading by reading the abstract conclusion. I use a related technique. The professor has a mini video lecture. I watch it before reading instead of after. Yeah, so research articles, don't let these bog you down because honestly, I can tell you, I've spent hours and hours writing notes and then like I literally used one conclusion from the study. So it's like, what am I trying to get out of this by reading this article? And then they say, skim the whole article one more time. I'll be honest, I very rarely do that. You want to make sure you're taking notes. Um, there's different kinds of programs. One program is called Ever Evernote. Another is called Zotero. I sent you guys a research article summary sheet. Again, because I'm old, I, use, I usually take my notes by hand. And there's some prompt questions and there are things to look at. like. If it was a research study, who were the participants? Uh, what were the limitations of the study? What did they find? What kinds of uh, measurements did they take? So there's some nice prompts on that worksheet that you can use to guide your attention. But definitely take some notes. Even if you're just writing, some people write like a little memo to themselves. They'll, they'll put down the citation and then they write a paragraph memo about what the study is about. But have some way that you're taking notes and keeping track of all of this. Um, Evernote and Zotero are fantastic because it's digitized, which is going to make it easier for writing your papers. Yes, definitely. All right, so we're pretty much out of time. I mean, I'll talk about Evoker very quickly. This is something you would use for um, if you're reading essays or philosophy, literature. This is the strategy you can use. Again, it's got an acronym, Evoker. For this one, what you do is uh, explore as you read through it once, okay? You're just like reading through it, and then um, you're going to flag any unknown words, flag any vocabulary, but not stop to look it up in a moment, okay? You're going to just push through because the second part is after we've read that, explore that first time, we go through it once, after you've done the whole reading, you're going to write down, look up all the unknown words, and write out the definitions for yourself. We're going to read it a second time, this time out loud, with emphasis and feeling. This is super helpful when you're reading these kinds of things, where it's S and uh, like uh, a play or a poem or philosophy. Philosophy is really tough for me to read because it's dialogical, and they like make a statement and a counter statement and a counter counter statement. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Why do you keep saying the same thing over and over? But that's the way that some of philosophy is written. So reading it out loud, it makes it a little easier for me to understand what I'm I'm reading. While I'm doing that oral reading, I want to pay attention. What are the key ideas? And are these good ideas or not? 
So I'm going to evaluate those ideas. And then the last R, recapitulate. It's just, again, a fancy word for saying, read it one more time for pleasure. So this method actually does require you to read it about three times, if not more. Poems, sometimes I have to read them four or five times before I under, completely understand it. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. So if you're right in the notebook type, there are notebooks you can write and then scan into your computer through their QR codes. <gasps> That's super cool. See all these awesome things that I'm learning today. So I wanted to give you guys some other resources. Um, Raul Pachero Vega, I am sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name. I've only ever seen it in writing. He is fantastic and puts out a whole bunch of posts and tweets about um, graduate school and being successful in grad school and he has a whole blog series about reading strategies. He does um, uh, skim, scribble, cross, cross, cross list is what he's what he recommends. So he skims an article, he scribbles some notes and then he makes connections, he cross lists with other articles that he's read. Um, so he does that a lot but he's got other reading techniques the um, OWL at Purdue, the online writing lab, talks about how to do a literature review. The, um, there's an article about how to read research papers. It goes into more detail than I did just now. And then if you ha don't have an electronic note-taking system, I recommend that you get something. It took a lot. For the, my last paper, I made myself use Zotero. I like forced myself to learn how to use it. And the nice part about Zotero, besides the fact it was developed at George Mason University, is that you can click the magic wand and it will put the citation in there for you. You have a place you can put notes, you can put um, like keywords so that you can search, and you can start building up a whole database of, of um, research articles that you're reading. And there's an add-on for Microsoft Word, so when you're actually writing your papers, it will populate your in-text items and your reference list at the end. And I cannot tell you, when you do a big, huge paper, like a thesis or a dissertation, trying to keep track of that all manually is so challenging. I wish I had had access to this when I did my thesis. Yes, yes, your thesis, my world changed when I just clicked bibliography and the whole thing is done. You definitely have to double check it and make sure it's correct. Um, but you, it'll let you choose what method do you want. Do you want Chicago, Turabian, do you want APA? Do you want LA? Um, oh, there's one for Google Docs. Yay. Yeah, so Zotero is fantastic. And they do have um, a video on the library webpage on how to use it. And um, they have workshops. The library has workshops that will help you how to learn, learn how to use it. I told my professor from my MA program, my, we stayed friends, and she is so mad she wanted us to suffer like she did. I can totally appreciate that. I can appreciate where the professor's coming from. All right, so that's all the time that I have. Are there any questions that you guys have? Where can I find the PDF to audio converter? So that's the read and write software that I was showing you guys earlier. And of course, all of my all of my animations. Okay, why don't you just end the show? There we go. I'll make it easier. So in Blackboard, on your home page, you can add a module, and you're going to add the accessibility module, and then you'll be able to see these downloads. And it's Read and Write that has that program in it. Amy says, I interact with my readings very much like you do with notes. And my concern is how to access all of that later when I'm working on comps dissertation. I'm a PhD program. Maybe more of a note-taking question than a reading question. So um, I have my handwritten notes, and then I would like do a little annotation paragraph. Um, and back in olden days, honestly, I used note cards. I would write a little summary on a note card, and then when you're doing research, you put like one topic on a card, you make them into piles. But you can do the same thing with Zotero. You would just type those notes, type up a little summary in to Zotero, and then you can sort the ideas together. Uh, 
Oh, okay. ATI, ATI read and write. Okay. You know, I've had this for a long time, so it could have been updated. I still have the old module in here. Annotation paragraph on Google Docs that's searchable. That's fantastic. Yeah, you go, that's what, you, it's kind of a two-step process. I'll do it in the moment, and then I'll have to, I would type up my information either into, I would use moat cards, and then I would do Excel spreadsheet is another way that I, that I would do it. Um, but, yeah, it's kind of a two-step process. All right, gang, thanks so much for coming. If you wouldn't mind taking a minute or two to um, fill out an evaluation so that we have feedback, I'm going to drop the link. If you don't have a QR code reader, you can use this link. But thank you so much for coming. Good luck. If you need some additional support, you can call Learning Services and schedule, ask to schedule an appointment for academic coaching. Make sure you tell the support staff member you are a graduate student. My undergrad students are lovely and they're fantastic coaches, but you probably should meet with one of the grad students or myself if you need some support. You are very welcome. Thanks for coming, guys. Have a good rest of your evening. Thanks for participating. Everybody did a great job participating. I appreciate that. I actually felt like there were people here. Sometimes I feel like I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. You're welcome. I'm going to stop recording.